Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, Trump all but clinches the Republican nomination. As the countdown to the U.S. presidential election continues, we ask, is he a match for Hillary? His own party doesn't seem to think so. And we sit down with former Prime Minister of France, Dominique de Villepin, whose outspoken opposition to the Iraq war proved prescient. He reflects on the various factors that created the current refugees and whether the EU can fix it. We start today's show with the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Republican nominee Donald Trump, the phrase was once the stuff of fantasy, but now it's all but set in stone almost after Senator Ted Cruz of Texas announced the end of his bid on Tuesday. In November's election, the New York billionaire is almost certain to face Hillary Clinton, who is widely expected to be the Democratic nominee. As the two major parties face internal divisions, many are asking what lies ahead for America in American politics. We gave it everything we've got. But the voters chose another path. And so, with a heavy heart, but with boundless optimism for the long-term future of our nation, we are suspending our campaign. And then there was Trump. I didn't expect it. And what Ted did is a, a really a very brave thing to do, and a great thing to do, because we want to bring unity to the Republican Party. Yes. We have to bring unity. It's so much easier if we have it. Echoing his thoughts, Republican National Committee Chairman Reince Priebus tweeted, We all need to unite and focus on defeating Clinton. The GOP is currently facing a deep divide within the party. Many party leaders will now be under pressure to announce their support for Trump, despite months of public misgivings about his lack of political experience and his attacks on women and minorities. Some even claim they'd rather vote for Clinton. Opinions are also split among the public. It's not a joke anymore. Everyone needs to uh, just put this to rest. Cannot elect a reality TV star to be president. I'm surprised, but uh, hopeful that he can do even some of the things he's promised. I'm beginning to come around to his way of thinking. Democratic nomination, however, has been slowed by rival Bernie Sanders' victory in Indiana. But it's widely believed that November will see a Clinton-Trump race. For many analysts, this would be a unique and historic election. Trump suffers from the worst national opinion poll ratings of any candidate of either party since at least 1984, with 67% of Americans holding an unfavorable opinion of him. Whether he wins or not, uh, the Republican Party is in the midst of a revolution. A revolution between uh, the people on the far right, the Tea Party so-called Freedom Caucus as represented in the House of Representatives, uh, and people who are angry at the establishment for not shrinking government, for not uh, cutting their taxes, for not improving their lives. Trump will need to win about 200 more delegates to clinch the nomination. He is likely to formally wrap up the nomination on June 7th when California votes. But for most, that once unthinkable title is already a sure thing. Republican nominee Donald Trump. For more discussion on the U.S. presidential election, we are joined here in the Beijing studio by Mr. Yuan Peng, who is the Vice President of the China Institutes of Contemporary International Relations. Welcome, sir, to our program. Meanwhile, in Washington, we are joined by Mr. Mark Putnam. He is the President of Putnam Partners and also a political media consultant. Meanwhile, in Iowa from the U.S., we are joined by Mr. Timothy Hagel, Professor of Political Science at the University of Iowa. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. First of all, I to throw this question simple and easy to our two American panelists. What do you make of it? Presumptive nominee of the Republican Party, Donald Trump. Mr. Putnam. Well, Mr. Trump has definitely tapped into a, a deep vein of anger and mistrust in the American electorate, especially in the Republican Party. A lot of anger at the establishment, as your piece uh, noted. 
Uh, and, and he's able to give voice to that. And a lot of people are looking for solutions. They're angry. There's an attitude of we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. And he's able to very easily capture that mantle. The problem is that, that he has a lot of negatives as a candidate that he's going to have to overcome. Mm. Is Mr. Trump the solution? Mr. Hagel. We'll see. Uh, he has a lot of <laughs> fence mending to do between now and first the convention and then of course during the general election. And I think that a lot of people probably will come around to him despite his high negatives that he has a certain charm, uh, even though some people don't see it right now, I suppose. But in terms of the message that he has, in terms of perhaps addressing the anger that Mr. Putnam was just saying, that he has an opportunity to talk about that and to talk about the negatives that uh, Hillary Clinton presents to the electorate as well. Mm. One of the things that's very important is what does this mean for the Republican Party? Earlier in our background piece, uh, there were analysts talking about so-called revolution. Uh, whether that is the word or not is really worth some more research. But let me ask you this, Mr. Putnam. How come one person without the support at all from the Republican Party establishment, who has been mainly talking about symptoms, not necessarily solutions to problems, would eventually be the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party. Is there something wrong with the Republican Party and also the Republican voters? Some ask. Well, you know, there is a great divide within the Republican Party right now sure. between the establishment and, and those who want to overturn the establishment. And so he, he has certainly tapped into that to the, to the extent that, that the Republican Party now has a nominee who in any other time would never be seriously considered just on base of his lack of experience, on his temperament, on his slurs towards women, and really for his lack of policy, policy proposals. So. I think really in some ways Mr. Trump is a symptom of this great divide within the party and the, the nominating electorate, the people that vote in Republican primaries are very anti-establishment. We're seeing that up and down the ballot at not just a presidential level but really at every level, governor races, senate races, house races. And so they're, they're taking out their mm -hmm. anger and frustration by voting for somebody that they think will go to Washington and shake it up. Now the problem is, is that there's a lot of danger in, in, uh, in Mr. Trump becoming president. He's a destabilizing force, stabilizing throughout the entire presidential campaign, and I really believe he'll be destabilizing as president. We've already heard your personal opinion over there, but let me come back to you, Mr. Yuan, here in Beijing. The most important question is, whatever the rhetorics of Mr. Trump during the past few months, seeking for the nominee, is that going, was it a tactic? Or was that the real content of this man? Can we judge? Mm, it uh, really depends on the American people to judge. But as a foreign observer of American domestic politics and also as a student of American pol uh, politics, I find it very interesting that it's time for us to check the so-called checks and the balances of American political system. Uh, what do you mean? I think the checks and the balances uh, is a basic uh, the essence of American political system, which many American posted is their advantages of the, their problem, uh, their politics. But today, the both extremists, one from Democrat Party, Bernie Sanders, another extremist, uh, Republican Party, uh, Donald Trump, which uh, is who both are very popular in both uh, can, uh, <coughs> voters show that the traditional uh, checks and balance system now face very deep uh, challenges. I think the reason is very uh, simple that the, the voters are not satisfied of the current political uh, system. Mm -hmm. there, the, the gap of between the rich and poor, between blue state and red state, between the establishment and the anti-establishment. Uh, right. And 80 years ago, the people began to think about they need to change. That's why they vote for President Obama, a young guy. But now they don't think that ch they, they think the change is not enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe they want to change even more radically. So that's why today we see the rise of uh, 
Donald Trump. Very interesting your analysis. Let me come back to you, uh, Professor Hegel, since you're a political science professor. Help us to understand this. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, the question that I asked uh, Mr. Yuan earlier, which is what Mr. Donald Trump is having in mind, was it just a tactic he was using in order to be different from the other candidates and win the voters by chance? Or is it really the content this man has in terms of the, the kind of policy approach he's likely to take? That's one thing. The other thing is, uh, what do you make of what Mr. Yuan just indicated to us earlier, that these quote-unquote traditional system of check and balances of American politics seem to be, at least for the moment, shaken to its real core essence? Let me start with the second part of that in the terms mm -hmm. of the checks and balances. Usually we think about that in terms of the three parts of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Right. And right now we have in America what we call a divided government in terms of the president being a Democrat and the both chambers of Congress, the Senate and the House, being controlled <clears throat> by Republicans. Well, sometimes, especially in an era of very partisan politics, that's going to mean that not a lot gets done. which some people like but many people don't like because then things that they want getting done aren't getting done and that's where this frustration comes in and that's what opens the door to a certain extent to somebody like a Donald Trump who basically has tapped into that as the other guest was saying the anger I usually think of it more as frustration mm -hmm. but it probably does border on anger for a lot of people who aren't getting the things out of government that they want whether it's more government or even less government in terms of the first part of your question, in terms of what is just sort of an act that Trump is putting on, and I think that's part of it, but it's part of it with a purpose in the sense that he does want to be the deal maker, he does want to shake things up. And so it's really not so much that Trump is barely an extremist, he's just something different entirely. Mm -hmm. And that he wants to cut through a lot of the political chatter, the double talk, the, right. what he sees as dishonesty and what many of the voters see as dishonesty, and basically present a new option for people. And the thing is, what's next? Uh, Mr. Putnam, there has already been reports uh, coming from the New York Times, of course, being regarded as more pro-Democrat uh, rather than Republican, but there are specific uh, facts reports talking about already began reaching out to the Republican establishment, yet the result is unknown. There are also many Republican, well-known Republicans inside your country talking to the media about the concern they have about this candidate, but at the same time, their frustration of they have to stand with the party, also have to support Mr. Trump. So uh, what do you make of this very entangled relations that we see in the Republican Party politics? It's, it's really unlike anything before. And, and we'll see how long this reaching out to the establishment actually happens. In the past, he's done it for half a day, and then he changes his mind, and then the oh. next... You know, next speech he gives, he's he's a, he's attacking the establishment again. So I think the establishment is rightly very wary of him, the Republican establishment, uh, as should all voters be very wary of him. But they are very wary of him because they can see the possible damage that can extend down the ticket. Um, we're already. I was involved in making an advertisement that featured many of Mr. Trump's vicious slurs against women and was able to tie that to uh, one of our opponents that were working on a Senate race where he had basically said, I'm going to support Mr. Trump. Well, if you're going to support Mr. Trump, you have to take all of it mm -hmm. and you have to be able to defend all of it. And so this, you're seeing the establishment extremely uncomfortable in a way that I've never seen before. Uh, and, and certainly in my 30 years of doing this, they are so uncertain about where he's going to take the party and where he would take the country right. as president that to, they've reached the point where they're saying enough. The other thing about the establishment, uh, but also about the traditional election system, has a lot to do with where the money comes from. And of course, uh, in Mr. Trump's case, the money at this moment mainly coming from his own pockets, like it or not. Uh, whether you question the source of uh, where his money comes from, that's another question. But, but the thing is, so what about in the future, near future, from now to the general election we are talking about against the Democrat opponent, uh, Mr. Hagel, Professor Hagel, what do you expect from uh, Mr. Trump? We're already hearing from Wall Street Journal reports that Mr. Trump was suggesting that he is not going to bill all of his uh, future actions in the campaign, but where would the money come from if there is so much uh, opposition in the party? 
Well, there is opposition in the party, but as I say, I think that between now and the convention and until the general election, that many in the establishment will come around, that they may not particularly like Trump for a variety of reasons, but they'll start to come around. And Trump has already begun to reach out to donors of various sorts, and even to the extent that uh, Trump, of course, is not going to self-fund the general election campaign, mm -hmm. uh, he will be able to draw on a variety of support from his initial base of supporters, but also those that see the advantage of, a, again, even if they don't like Trump, they realize that for the health of the Republican Party and many of the other people that are running in the House and the Senate and the state legislative races, that they do need to support support the party to a certain extent plus there are going to still be people that even again they don't like trump they still think trump's going to be better than hillary clinton well that's certainly true for the republican party i guess uh, but when it comes to general voters that is a really interesting question isn't it we see a totally different picture of two candidates uh, one is Mr. Donald Trump was going to be nominated uh, very likely as the republican nominee then it is unconventional very much with a lot of personality characteristics and also with a lot of the negativities that the voters have to also embrace. On the other hand, it's a very traditional politician we're talking about, seasoned, experienced, also controversial to a certain extent. Uh, what do you make of that, uh, Mr. Yuan Peng, uh, coming, observing it from afar, from China? Mm, from China, you know. I know you just came back yeah. from Washington and talked to many of your friends and uh, colleagues uh, over there. So, what is your sense here? You know, as a China uh, Chinese observer of American politics, what we concern most is uh, which candidate is more uh, supportive of future U.S. and China relations. Mm. Mainly, comparison which is better in Chinese media. But I think that today, you know, China really don't care who will be the next American president. I think the future policy really rely on, first of all, the doctrine and vision of the president per se, but also much more rely on its teams. The teams you know, matters more mm. than a specific uh, candidate or the president. So as for our relations, and it really depends on our uh, economic uh, deeply interdependence, interdependence in political and strategic. So, but Mr. Yuan, I have to follow up with that because you see two candidates hmm. pretty much confident about where they stand. Uh, Donald Trump, for example, during the uh, campaign season, you don't see any other person as hmm. the face of his campaign, but rather he himself, everything he will answer the questions. And also for uh, Secretary Clinton, of course, she's extremely experienced and seasoned. She has already developed some China policy when she was in the office as the Secretary of State. So you're not likely to just see the team, but really very two unique personalities over there. Actually, uh, Don Trump, if we follow Donald Trump's uh, tactics, we can see very clearly that uh, in the past days, he has already changed his tactics. Mm. At the very beginning of the primary, he used some radical rhetoric to attract those uh, really fans. But now becoming the really uh, candidate of the uh, Republican, now getting more and more uh, realistic. And uh, I guess if uh, finally a uh, nominee as the uh, candidate of GOP to be competitor of uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, he will be more and more uh, objective and uh, realistic. I hope so. <laughs> as for the Hillary Clinton, I think uh, quite familiar with her. Yes. I think uh, on the one hand, maybe she a little bit seems a little bit tougher than this President, President Obama, but on the other hand, I think she has his own uh, vision of uh, U.S. and China relations. And of course, mm. when that person, whoever it is, mm. coming into the Oval Office, a lot of things has to be re-streamlined. Uh, that is very important. When we talk about uh, the competition possibly between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, we have already seen some interesting numbers. Though Trump has secured his first major success, Hillary Clinton is actually leading the comes to the Democrats. Uh, CNN's latest poll suggests that uh, Clinton is more trusted than Trump on various issues, including terrorism, immigration, health care, the income gap, foreign policy, education, climate change, many other things. Overall, voters are evenly split, according to the CNN polls, on their opinion of Clinton, have seen her favorably, and the same view, her 
the same also view her unfavorably, but a decidedly larger group sees Trump unfavorably than those who see him favorably. Of course, we have to make sure we understand the nature of the media because the media could also have certain tendencies uh, uh, when it comes to the U.S. media scene. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, Professor Hegel, uh, when it comes to the comparison of these two possible candidates from two parties, what do you think might stand out among all their qualities? Eventually, which one is likely to be the most important qualities of these two candidates? It's very possible that the most important quality is how they stand on the economy, because mm. part of what makes the frustration and what propelled Trump to the nomination for the Republican Party is his stand as uh, where he stands on the economy, where he stands on jobs. Uh, the other things, they kind of are distractions, they got attention in various ways, which is maybe part of the plan. But the thing that seems to be most important to the voter, where the candidates, not just Trump, but both, stand on jobs in the economy. Even though the economy is covering for the last eight years, it's been very slow glowing and not a lot of people have really felt the benefits. And so to really improve on that is where I think a lot of people are going to focus, despite the negatives of somebody like Trump or even the negatives of Clinton. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, Mr. Putnam, uh, future policies? Uh, besides the economy, let me also ask you an interesting question, foreign policy, which, of course, people around the world are more interested in the United States uh, than just the economy. Uh, Mr. Trump, during his campaign, talking about he's favoring more so-called uh, promotion, quote unquote, on Western civilization. I don't know exactly what that means, but that's what his quote. And then a uh, military intervention when it comes to U.S. approach to the other countries. He's against the uh, Obama administration's military intervention, even though we know Obama administration compared to the previous one was doing much less of that. But that was his opinion. What would that mean? And can that win hearts and minds overseas or the other way around? It's hard to see how it wins hearts and minds overseas. It's a very xenophobic approach. Mm -hmm. he's, he's basically an isolationist, and he wants to engage in trade wars. Uh, he thinks that the American manufacturing sector has suffered because of countries, frankly, like China, and so he, he wants to be very aggressive on that. But I, what I think is important for the Chinese people to understand is that it's not just trade wars. I mean, he's actually quite a, lot, quite a bit worse than that. He wants to allow South Korea and Japan to have nuclear weapons. He's in favor of torture. He wants to ban Muslims from entering our country. He wants to build a tall wall to keep the you know, Mexican people out of our country. Um, he even thinks it's okay to kill the families of terrorists. So. You know, and these are positions he's taken and stuck by throughout this campaign. So it would be interesting to see if he softens any of that, as Mr. Mm. As Mr. Young predicted. I'm not so certain. I think he has a lot to answer for on his foreign policy. And he really, and, and his, the basis of his foreign policy experience, he'll tell you his dealings with China. First off, he thinks that, that climate change is a Chinese hoax, which is offensive. Um, and also his business experience with China is selling a $33 million apartment to a Chinese businessman. That's, that's what he points to in serious interviews about right. his experience with China. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a lot that pe Chinese people should learn about him. Mr. Parnam have already done his research when it comes to all the details of uh, Mr. Trump's rhetoric. Uh, but let me go to you very briefly, Professor Hagel. What do you make of what uh, Mr. Parnam just said, uh, if you can very briefly? It, it, that's basically the, what the Democrats are going to portray it as. The, the problem for Trump is he said a lot of these things. The question is how much he's meant them. He's softened on other things, and sometimes he even reverses field almost immediately on some particular issue. But the, that's part of the problem is that we just don't know what his ultimate policies are going to be. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yuan, of course, <laughs> you heard to your two American <laughs> colleagues. Now it's your turn. Uh, what do you make? All uh, of these rhetorics. I want to thank the, the two excellent American uh, you know, counterparts to remind the Chinese to know more deeply about uh, uh, who uh, Trump is. Actually, so far, uh, we don't care too much what he said during the primary uh, stage mm -hmm. of the election. We we'll care more and more seriously after the primary to the real general election. And what's more, after who will be the next president will take more seriously to research who the teams are mm -hmm. and what uh, not only the, the words but the, the, the deeds. I think in terms of this, I think we still uh, have some expectation to the two uh, you know, possible 
uh, candidates. But our confidence comes by, uh, from the deep roots of the relations, that the people-to-people -people relations, economic, mm. economic relations, even our military to military relations today is still um, more and more mature. So just like a game for Chinese to observe, the, the, the American election, uh, presidential election, just give right. us some uh, lesson to how to understand American politics more, more comprehensively. Well, certainly it is, it is interesting and entertaining, but on the other hand, also quite uh, important to watch that drama going on in the U.S. For now, I want to thank the three of you gentlemen for being with us. A lot of insights, and certainly we learned a lot. We are going to expect more. Yuan Peng, Mark Putnam, and Timothy Hagel. Really appreciate it, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Insight. We've got our final segment coming right up. Join us for a discussion with the Prime Minister of France, Dominique de Lille Le Pen, whose opposition to the Iraq war proved the prescient. He looks back on the various factors that created the current refugee crisis and has some thoughts on how the EU can move forward. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside on CCTV News. I'm Tian Wei. The European migrant crisis has somewhat subsided, at least in numbers. Many believe it has something to do with temporary border closures and the EU's deal with Turkey to divert migrants. But the chaotic struggle of this crisis has laid bare the many challenges facing the EU. The lack of coordination among member states, the lack of a common sense of destiny, and the sense that some of the most critical relationships in Europe have eroded. For example, between Germany and France, or between Britain and the EU itself. Former French Prime Minister Dominique de Le Bain has always had a strong voice, both in office and in the years since. I caught up with him at the Boal Forum for Asia earlier this spring, and he elaborated on what these challenges may mean for Europe and particularly his native country. Before we play that interview for you, some background information first. The migration crisis has exposed significant flaws in the EU's asylum policy. The problem is a mechanism known as the Dublin Regulation, which dictates that refugees seek asylum in the first EU country they enter. It allows countries to deport asylum seekers back to their first entry point, leaving countries like Greece and Italy to deal with the majority of cases. This has sparked tension among EU members. On Wednesday, the EU proposed reforms to the current policy. It will now calculate a fair share of asylum seekers' country's population and economy. If a country receives more than 150 percent of its annual fair share, a relocation scheme will kick in. A proposed sanction of $290,000 per person would be imposed on countries refusing to take their share. The EU also recently reached a deal with Turkey, aiming to discourage refugees from departing Turkey for Greece. Germany has been one of the top destinations for arrivals in Europe, and it has taken an active role in helping the crisis. In comparison to Germany, France has mostly flown under the radar on these issues. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to CCTV News. Thank you. The question is, has France taken a back seat to Germany in terms of the recent migration crisis? Well, I don't think so. That may be the impression one may have after the last uh, European Council. In fact, we have to understand first that uh, Europe is facing one of the biggest challenges that uh, it has ever has to face. Um, hundreds of thousands of refugees trying to come into the European really a disrupting situation for most of our countries. So the answer is not easy. And I'm not even sure that the answer that has been taken in the last European Council is going to be the good one. We are facing a problem of legality. We are facing a problem of credibility, of feasibility. How is it going to be possible 
to implement such a plan with Turkey, there are already many questions. So, Mr. Prime Minister, are you suggesting that you do not agree with well, the current plan of I, the EU? Is that what you're saying? You do not I agree with the German Chancellor Angela Merkel's policy written so far? Well, I agree with Angela Merkel on the fact that Europe should do more. Of course, we have to understand that many countries don't want to do more. We have the eastern countries, some of the southern countries which are facing a huge challenge, countries like Greece, uh, Italy, uh, Portugal, Spain, France, are quite reluctant in doing more. But I think we have to do more because that's our duty. We have an obligation to give asylum to people who are running from war. You think? But what about France, Ro? I mean, France has not been doing much, at least uh, I agree. too, too I agree. many. That's what I'm saying. We should do more. And we should really be able to differentiate the asylum for the people who are trying to escape from war and the economic migrants, which is something different. So we should really try to differentiate the two have a stronger and wider policy, more generous, which implies uh, more work to be done in order to identify where could we receive these people in order to give them an employment, an education, a perspective, a future. Knowing that most of them should not stay in the European Union. Mm -hmm. When you are a Syrian, when you are uh, coming from Afghanistan right. or in Iraq, you should not make your life in Europe. So but it's it's the time of the war, and okay. we really do be able to solve be before this we talk, political we, before crisis. Before we talk about the migrants themselves, that is their life, what about the choice of France, because you are from that country, and you also serve as the prime minister for some years of the country. So uh, what about France's current policy? Should it be more active in terms of coming up in drawing up the policy with the EU, with your partner Germany, or France should be always at this moment at the back seat because of domestic reasons? No, I, I don't think France ever should be at the back seat on any But then what subject. do you make of the current situation? Well, France is under pressure because of the terrorist attacks, because of the rise of populism in our country. The movement of the far right are using this uh, theme of the refugee, these difficulties, in order to criticize the policy of the government. That's why it creates a, a strong pressure on the current government. But you could also argue the same thing about Germany. They just no, had the local Germany, election far right as well, right. also no, rising in some localities. But, but Germany is not at all in the same situation. Germany, because of demographic, it's an aging population. Germany needs more migrants in order to have some labor work capacity, stronger uh, labor work capacity in their own country, which is not the problem of France today, where we are facing also a strong challenge of unemployment. We have so many people unemployed that it creates also a political and social issue in our country. So the two countries are not in the same situation, but we know that Europe cannot work if Germany and France are not working together. Born in 1953, Dominique de Villepon is a French politician who served as Prime Minister from 2005 to 2007. During a previous term as Foreign Minister, he came into the international spotlight for his opposition to the U.S. plan to invade Iraq. A decade later, some argue that the Iraq War has provided soil for terror to grow, resulting in social religious chaos in the Middle East that continues to this day. Some believe ISIL has in fact evolved in response to the U.S. invasion and has pushed millions of people into Europe in search of shelter. Villepin shares some thoughts about what this means for transatlantic relations today. And at this moment, when you have the migration crisis, it's already a big test to the overall concept of the European Union. You have going to have a streamline of everything, ideology of the basic values of the European Union about migration, about the diversity of cultures, about immigrants, about yes. all of these but economic no, situations right, as well. Right. So but you could, you could add at the same time that we are facing the risk of Brexit. There is a strong risk that UK might step out of Europe. So we have, and we have the terrorist problem. So we have all this problem at the same time. This is a big challenge for Europe. But at the same time, we have gone through our history 
we have faced such challenges before. And that's why I really do believe... Tell me about the similar situations, the challenges before. What is the, it? The wars. We had two, two world wars in Europe in the 20th century. So we've been facing, we have a huge economic crisis in, 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 in the cities. So we've been facing big challenges and we have been able to face these challenges because we find a way of unity. Well, so with the help of Americans, some would argue, for example, about the war. But for, for the war, that's true. But unity is the key. And you have to understand, this is not on a, a problem for Europe. It's a problem for Asia. Asia's growth is having a problem. And it is a problem for the emerging countries, which are, are facing also a problems of growth. So it's a global issue. Some of these problems should be tackled at the world level. We need more world governance. We need more regional governance. And we need the European countries to take their responsibility. Okay, and let not me ask to you. let the people of, 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 of in this country being, being played by fear and by this ask you, is the problem. Let me ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, you talk about we should have the courage. So many Europeans that have been talking to, they all have the courage off the record, talking about the war in Iraq, the war in Syria, in fact, very much linked to what the crisis Europe is having in terms of the migration in recent years. But no one dare to stand out politician-wise to say to those who started the war in Iraq, and also make versions to the situation in the Middle East, that those are the root causes and they have to be responsible. Well, I, I said that many times. That's why you left the politics, isn't exactly. it? No, because you're, you're right. a straight talker. So what about politics inside Europe? What is going to be the, the European status vis-a-vis -vis your relations across the Atlantic and also your responsibilities as a result of this partnership? I think that uh, we should take the lessons of the past mistakes. You are right. Uh, it was a mistake uh, to uh, choose military intervention in Afghanistan, in Iraq, as well as in Libya. This explains the current problems that we are facing in the Middle East. And this explains also why terrorism is so active and so dangerous in Europe. So we have to understand and take the lesson of that. Instead, many governments, and including the French government, too often are considering that through military force, we, going, we are going to answer uh, the problems of ISIS and the problem of Islamism. I don't believe so. I think we should be much more subtle and there to answer this mm. crisis is political. We should unite our capacities with all the, the, the big countries of the world in order to try to find solutions dividing the terrorists from their support. And their support today are very often sunny groups, sunny tribes in Syria, in Iraq. Mm. We should avoid the links between this group that support ISIS and the terrorists, which are a real minor minority. So I think we have solutions, but we need to tackle the lessons of the past. Once again, Mr. Prime Minister, the plan is the plan. What about the real actions? Uh, you've been to many of the international important uh, conferences throughout this year. Uh, you have noticed, I'm sure, as I did, that the Europeans are just thinking about the issue of migration, while the rest of the world are thinking about very different sets of issues. So will that drive the Europeans, including France, even further away from, shall we say, the mainstream of the world, what would that eventually mean for the for the Europeans? And and, and some some final points, your advice, where to start with, at this moment. My advice would be forget the anger, forget the fear. The worst scenario for Europe is to forget that action and unity are the two keys. So we should really stand strongly, accept the fact that the challenges are huge but understand that we need to go forward. So I really believe solidarity, unity, and action, as you mentioned it, are the real solutions. Those are big words, but those are also very stressful words. We wish those words will become actions as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your input, Mr. Thank Prime you. Minister. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much. Our interview with uh, Dominique de Villepin, former Prime Minister of France, uh, he tried to articulate eloquently about the challenges that the European countries are facing as reflected by the migrant crisis and also the common destiny that the European countries should have even when it comes to cross-Atlantic relations.
And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insight CCTV News into your search engine. You'll be able to find us. Or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Insight team, thanks for watching and tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.